Hi, I'm Susan Swain, host of C-SPAN's Q&A, where we spend an hour with nonfiction writers and historians who add context to today's news. On this episode, you'll meet Washington Post syndicated finance columnist Michelle Singletary, author of What to Do with Your Money When Crisis Hits. She discusses how people should prepare financially for economic downturns. She also talks about her love of budgets, her hatred of debt, and the outlook for the U.S. economy. Our conversation will begin in just a moment. Nationally syndicated personal finance columnist Michelle Singletary has a new book, with, and it's your fourth, and it's What to Do with Your Money When Crisis Hits. You tell readers in the book that one thing that's a certainty is financial downturns and disruptions. Was there anything particular about the COVID economy that made it different from past financial downturns? I think the scope of it, obviously, um, just the complete shutdown, I wish it complete, but um, a near shutdown of so many businesses. Uh, and it, I think it was a wake up call for a lot of people. Um, it, um, let me rephrase that. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, I think it was a wake up call for a lot of people that they had so little to, to sustain them through such a long uh, economic downturn. Uh, but the fact of the matter is there are have been crises and will continue to be economic crises in the future. Statistics about the past year and a half suggest that women overall and particularly women of color were impacted at a greater degree than even others in the pandemic economy. What are you learning from your many social interactions, social media presentations about the particular challenges people like that faced? Well, you know, I think we always knew that there were so many millions of people living paycheck to paycheck. And I think the pandemic showed us how tenuous people's lives were. Um, In fact, they weren't really even living paycheck to paycheck. They were barely limping to when they got, you know, additional funds for the work that they did. And also just how close people were to, um, to, to disaster, financial disaster. I mean, they're making so little that they couldn't put money aside to save, not just for a typical crisis, but something where they would be out of work for months. Um, and we knew that there was a concentration of minorities and women in the service industry and lower paid jobs but it's almost as if we just pull the cover over our heads and say, that's them over there. They'll just figure out how to make it when we realize that their downfall was our downfall as well. The government pumped tremendous sums of money into the economy through various COVID relief programs. Some things like direct payments to individuals, the Paycheck Protection Program, rent forbearance. Has the deployment of these federal programs impacted the advice that you give to people? It has not, actually. Um, It actually has enhanced the advice because it's really hard for you to tell people who are making minimum wage or less than minimum wage, you need to save, you need to put money away for your kids to go to college. And they're thinking, listen, I can barely put food on the table and keep a roof over my head. And and the, the aid that they received showed them what it was like to have a, a backstop. Um, it was completely necessary. It kept millions of families um, from going under and out of poverty. Um, and so now what I'm telling people is, you got to, perhaps we need to rethink a whole lot of things. For example, you know, like in the book, I talk about the importance of shared housing, um, that everybody just cannot have their own place. Um, multi-generational housing, which we had during the pandemic, right? People left their apartments, adults uh, just out of college decided to stay home or they moved in, you know, three and four people to a place. And I think that is what's, what we're going to be needing in the future to make sure that people can have a safety net for themselves, right? If housing takes up so much of your budget, we need to give people a little bit of relief and give them permission to live with people. Be, you know, be, give them permission and say it's okay if you're 30 living at home, if you are trying to save um, and not spend 60, 70% of your paycheck on your rent. Having a backstop uh, in times uh, difficult times is really the bedrock of all the advice that you've given to people over the years. And you write in the book that you've always managed your own finances as if you're in a perpetual recession. What's that really look like? 
you know, when I wrote that, I knew I'd get some a little bit of feedback that, what, are you just crazy scared all the time? And I, it's not something that I do out of fear, but of planning. Um, I liken it to, for example, uh, the fire uh, people, people who uh, are work, in fire, work in fire stations. And so the whole time that they're there, they're not fighting fires every day, but they're checking the equipment. They're making sure the hoses are okay. Even if a fire calls in, they can quickly jump into the outfits that they need to fight the fire. Um, that's what I'm saying when I say I want to live in a perpetual recession. I'm preparing for that next crisis. You hope there won't be a fire. You do. You hope. They don't want it to be a fire, but they know know that it will be. And that's what I'm talking about. I know I'm in a good position. Many people are in a good position, but you don't know what tomorrow will bring. And so I try to live below my means. I don't probably live on the salary that I make now. I live on a salary I made maybe 10 years ago. I don't elevate my um, lifestyle every time I get a raise because I know that there's going to be another crisis. And if I don't need the funds, I know that somebody in my life will. And so, for example, my husband and I have like a a family and friends fund where we put money aside to help people in our lives who will lose their jobs, who will have a a disruption in their income and will need assistance. Do you live a life of complete frugality? Do you ever allow yourself (laughs) splurges? You know, um, yes and no. (laughs) I'm extremely frugal. um, And that's just how I'm wired. Uh, But there are things that we do. Uh, We take a two week vacation every year. Um, You know, we give a lot to our church. Um, We're very charitable, my husband and I. Um, But if you ask me what I splurge on, I I probably couldn't dig up anything under maybe Scrabble dictionaries. (laughs) You know, I have more than a a normal person should have. Um, And I think that has a lot to do with my background. I think the unique position I'm in is that I came from a low-income background. My parents abandoned me, and my grandmother had to step in and take care of me and my siblings. There were five of us. And she literally, literally saved us from a car ride to foster care. And watching her take care of us, and my grandfather had a drinking problem, so all his money didn't make it home. And just watching her manage that money taught me a lot that I needed to be do the same, even when I did well. Um, and so I come from a situation where I know, I know hunger. I knew hunger. I, I knew what it was like not to have enough food before I went to go live with my grandmother. Um, so I have an affinity for people. I have empathy for people who are struggling. I know that struggle. I was that, I was your kid, um, who may not have a meal that night. Uh, and now that I'm doing better for myself, I don't forget that. I understand what it's like. And, and that's why I wrote this book. I wanted people to know I know what it means when you say you don't have any money for food. Um, but I also want to help you build the resources to have a little bit on the side when a crisis hits. I want to give you advice that when you do do well, how do you make sure you don't fall on bad habits and, and spend more than you make? Um, and so I, and I, and I learned a lot of that from, from my grandmother. You write about your grandmother in the book and her name for you, that you called her was Big Mama. Um, right. Can you tell me a little bit more about some of the money management tricks that she had that stayed with you? <laughs> I like to joke that my grandmother held a penny. Lincoln would scream. <laughs> she was tight. Um, the thing I learned, the first lesson I learned from my grandmother is to hate debt. My grandmother hated debt. And I joke now that if debt was a person, I'd slap it. I, I just hated mortgage debt. You know, I don't, that's really all I have right now. Car debt, you know, my husband, I haven't had a car note in, I don't know, 20, 25 years. So we keep our cars to wear on a first name basis with the local tow truck drivers. So she learned me to have a healthy hatred for debt because debt limits your choices. And then she taught me how to save from every dollar that I made. She said, put something away from 
every dollar that you made, at least 10%. And I did that from my very first job at 14 years old as a tutor. Uh, and if I could tell you this quick story about time, my first job at the Baltimore Evening Sun, my first week on the job, there was a huge fire and I was covering the fire and I made the front page. I called my grandmother so excited, you know, new reporter, big paper, made the front page. And the first question on her mouth was, did you go up to HR and make sure that you put money away in the credit union account? And I said, no, 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 I'll get to that later. Let me tell you about the fire. And she hung up on me. <laughs> and I was like, okay, well, maybe the line went dead or something. I called her back trying to tell her about my big story. She said, did you go and put that money away from your paycheck and make sure they take money out of every single paycheck? And I said, no, she hung up again. And I went upstairs to HR, put in the request to have my money taken out to put in a savings account. Then I called my grandmother back and I told her that I did that. And then she listened. <laughs> She listened to my story about having a front page, you know, article in the big city paper. I'll never forget that, that she she was thinking about my future even when I wasn't thinking about it. And I have taken that advice. So now every time I get money, I don't even care if it's a dollar. I put some away. I've taught that to my children as well. And they're great savers and money managers because of that advice from my grandmother. One of the other things you described that your grandmother did was always do a budget, on the, even if it was on the back of an envelope. And in your basic advice, you really stress the importance of everybody having a budget. What's a budget look like for an individual and why is it so important? You know, um, here's the thing. The budget for me is like GPS. So would you, like say I live in the on the East Coast, and if I was taking a trip to, say, California, driving across country, I'd want to map it out. I'd have my GPS, you know, I'd plug in where I was going, and it would tell me where to go. When you don't have a budget, it's like trying to go from the East Coast to the West Coast with no direction. Your budget is that GPS. It tells you where you can go. And it tells you when you need to stop, right? Like if you're taking a trip and you get off track, the GPS will say, you know, recalculate, it'll reroute you to where you need to be. That's how your budget is. It's a living document. It's not something you put on paper and then forget. It tells you what you can do. It tells you what you can't do. And I know a lot of people hate budgeting. They just hate it. But for me, it's freedom. It tells me exactly what I can and cannot do. Um, and it's just, I, I know my numbers intimately. Uh, and I love, I just love my budget. I have my two loves of my boo, my husband, and my budget. Because it just allows me to to put my money where my values are. And so people say, well, how do you stay on track? I just look at my budget, see what I can do, and I give myself little notes here and there. And it's how my husband and I were able to send all three of our kids to college debt-free. It's how we are going to pay off our mortgage before we retire. We have an account to help family members. We tithe in our church. It just, it sets up the whole lifestyle for what we want to do with the money that we earn. So this is the kind of advice you give in sections of your book that are about the basics, things that apply anytime, even when there's not a crisis going on. I, I do want to dig into things specific for crisis times. Let me start by asking you where you think we are right now regarding the COVID economy. <clears throat> We're talking in the summer of 2021. I saw a new Gallup poll yesterday that said that uh, the percentage of Americans who evaluate their lives as thriving, thriving, has reached 59% in June, the highest in over 13 years of measurement. It had plunged, as you can imagine, during COVID. Does this indicate to you that the corner has turned for most people? I think that it has turned for the haves, but not the have-nots. The pandemic showed us that we had an economy of the haves and the have-nots. And we want to rejoice that things are turning around, but we need to also remember that there are still millions of people who are out of work. There are still millions of people who aren't sure where their next meal is going to come from. 
or that they're going to be able to keep the roof over their heads. And so while I rejoice and better job numbers, unemployment is coming down, people are going back to work. I also know that there are a lot of people who are still suffering. And we need to remember that even if your own situation is getting better, you need to realize that there are so many other people who can't make it because either they don't have a job or the job that they have doesn't pay them enough doesn't pay them a living wage. As a corollary to this question, what do you make of the statistics that are showing us that the labor market is really tight, that people are delaying going back to work or thinking about complete career redirections? What does that signal to you? I think a lot of people took took uh, uh, notice of what was going on and they took us, they assessed their life and they said, you know what, I'm not going to be working in this job all day, every day, putting my health at risk in some cases, if you, you know, helping the public um, for the money that doesn't do everything that I need it to do, um, you know, help me get ahead. And so two words, this pandemic that people are saying is I quit. I, I, can't, I, I need to do something else. Um, and I don't think it's a sign of people being lazy or not wanting to work. I think they have reassessed how they want to work. And I don't blame them in the least. If you work in the service industry, especially if you're serving the public, a public that isn't all on board in, to, in terms of what it needs, <clears throat> in, in terms of what needs to be done to keep them and you safe, I get it. And and the benefits that the the boost up unemployment benefits and all the other things that were put in place to help people survive has allowed people to take. Um, to reassess their lives and say, I, 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 maybe I need to do more training. <clears throat> Excuse me. Or, um, you know what? I was working this job 14 hours a day and I couldn't see my family. And during a time where family was so important that we couldn't see them, they're saying, you know what? I, I need to do something a little di- bit different. Um, and I think that's, that's great. I think that it will pressure Uh, both policymakers and employers to rethink working conditions and wages. There also seems to be a new spurt of entrepreneurialism, uh, self-employment or new businesses being being started. You looked back at what happened in 2008 with the, the big financial crisis when another spate of entrepreneurialism happened. How did that generally turn out for people? Well, you know, it. a lot of businesses did grow out of the Great Recession, and a lot of businesses are now growing out of the pandemic. Um, I just caution that we know statistically lots of small businesses fail, um, that not necessarily because people aren't good at what they do, lack of capital, um, you know, money management. Um, it's very tough to run a, a small business. Um, and so people are not, they have the idea for the business, they have the skills for the business, but they lack the financial training to make it successful. Um, and so I think it's a great thing. Oftentimes in this country, we think everybody works for big corporations, but in fact, most people do work for small businesses and it is important to our economy. Um, I just uh, hope that many people take the time that they need to make sure that they are doing their own personal finances. So not just their business succeeds, but they succeed financially. Well, let's do a deeper dive into the COVID relief that you suggest in your book uh, for people who are still struggling, haven't found their jobs yet, haven't been rehired. First of all, let me ask you about how the book came about. So HMH um, uh, Publishing Company, which is now part of Hopper Collins, and I thought about how do we address the current uh, pandemic, but make it an evergreen? Because oftentimes, you know, a crisis happens, we get out of it, we kind of forget it. And I wanted to write a book that said, it's not a matter of if there's going to be another economic crisis, but when. And so we want to set you up actually for the next crisis. It's actually not all about COVID, but what uh, recession is going to come down the road. It may be long, it may be short, but life is going to happen. And I need you to prepare now. Do you know, I, I do a lot of financial seminars in my community. And it's so hard to get people to save and prepare when they're doing well because they, they're doing well. They don't think that tomorrow is going to have an issue. 
And so I say, you need to save, you need to do that. And like, oh yeah, yeah, I'm going to get to it. I'm going to get to it. Now, when a crisis hit, everybody's in, you know, frugal mode. They're ready to do it, but that's too late. The time to do that is when you have the resources, when you have the ability to cut. It's easy to cut when you can't pay for anything or things are shut down. And so I wanted to say, let's prepare. Let's be like that fireman or that firewoman who's ready for that next fire. They don't hope, they hope it won't happen, but they're going to be prepared for that. And so that's how the book came about. And we also wanted to make it very accessible. So it's written in an FAQ fashion, you know, short chapters, um, short answers, some of them short, um, because, you know, when you're in a crisis, you don't want to read a 200 page financial book. That's the last thing you want to do. Um, and you can skip around to the issues that relate to you. I really wanted to make it very accessible to everyone, whether you're in a crisis or have never been in a crisis or, or you are the person that other people come to for help. And I want to give those people the answers to better help those who are in need. So let's focus on those people who didn't prepare and they've lost their jobs. What's the biggest mistake that people tend to make when that circumstance hits them? You know, oddly enough, and, and, and people may not believe this, but that when people lose their jobs, they want to pay everybody. They just, and so whatever little money they have, they try to, you know, uh, parcel it out to, to creditors and pay their bills. Um, but that's not what you should do, actually. And it goes against the wisdom that, that most people have or the things that we teach, you know, pay all your bills, pay them on time. But when you had uh, a job loss or a disruption in your income, you got to go in triage mode. Uh, and I talk about that in the book. And, and for those who may not be familiar with that term, if you've ever gone to an emergency room and say you've had a sprained ankle and you go in you're, in, you're in pain and you're sitting there and you're waiting and waiting and someone comes in after you and they take them before you and you, you get kind of funky about that. You're like, wait a minute, I've been here. But what you don't know is that person is having a heart attack. And while your ankle and your pain is completely legitimate, they got to take care of that other person. You got to treat your bills the same way. So if you only have a certain amount of income, you got to pay the necessities and other things are just not going to get paid. Um, you Now call your creditors, let them know what's going on, but it may mean that major bills are not going to get paid, even maybe your rent or your mortgage, because for that day, for that little money that you have, you got to put food on your table, right? And maybe keep the lights on. Uh, and then later in the book, I talk about this, how you we can help you rebuild your credit score and all those kinds of things. And even for like your home, um, if you can't pay your mortgage, call your, your mortgage servicer and ask for a forbearance or, you know, a payment in a pause in your payment um, because you're not going to be put out tomorrow. Um, and so I just want people to focus on just the bare necessities. And I want to give them permission to do that without judgment, right? And it doesn't matter if they were a good money manager or not, because lots of people will wag their finger and say, well, they deserve what they get. They didn't handle their money well. Well, you know what? When people are in need, that is not the time to wag your finger at that at them. It's time to have empathy and help them figure out how to get through this crisis and then teach them how to do better going forward. Well, staying with uh, calling your creditors, uh, people might be really loath to do that, thinking these are big impersonal corporations. What use is it going to be? What, what do you say to that? You know, and that's what the creditors say. People don't call us landlords. I heard from so many landlords who said, my tenant didn't even call me and tell me that they were out of work. Uh, I it, it is counterintuitive to call someone when you don't have any money because you're thinking, I don't have any money. What can I tell them? Well, you can tell them I've lost my job. You can tell them I'm, I'm, I'm getting some unemployment. I can pay you maybe 20 or $50 where I owe you a hundred every month. So it, the communication is important because when you communicate, 
people, and I know people are like shaking their head, but corporations, businesses, they understand this. They will be, they will work with you. I hear it from creditors all the time. And especially during the pandemic, if you have, for example, a federal mortgage, they were mandated to work with you. So, and I've been a landlord myself. And I appreciated when my tenant at one point, she was a single mom, uh, lost her job. And she called me. She said, I've lost my job. I'm so sorry. I can't pay you this month. I said, you know what? The first thing I said to her is thank you for calling me. And because she had been such a good tenant prior to that, I allowed her to stay there and not pay rent for several months. And when she started working again, I said to her, you know what? There's no way you're going to catch up on this Don't worry about it. I got you. You do not have to pay me this money back because I was a saver and I was able to make my mortgage payments without her money. And I felt like why burden her? I know that she's a hard worker. She's not going to be able to catch up and it'll just put her further behind. Now, I know every landlord can't do that, but I wanted her to know that I was in her corner. And I, and I think she appreciated it. That did come to a point where, you know, she still wasn't working enough hours. And so we talked it out and I said, honey, you know, I encourage you for as long as I can. Um, you know, how can I help you find, you know, better housing? And I, she went home to live with, um, a relative. And so that's what I'm talking about. Her communicating to me and her already having been a good tenant put me in the position where I'm like, I want to help you. That's what happens when you call and you communicate. Now, it doesn't always happen that way. You may call and they go, I don't care. I want my money. And then you fall back to the triage method. You say, okay, I, I don't have it for you. I have to keep a roof over my head and food on the table. You also uh, look at some of the ways that people turn to options when they are in an ex- extremis. One of those is uh, debt relief companies. We see them advertised on television all the time. What's your view of them? Stay away. Run. Run as fast as you can. Um, you know, the majority of the time, they're going to make the situation worse. So typically how these these operations work is that they'll ask you to pay a, a, a fee. And it can be very high, several thousand dollars in some cases. And all they're really saying is we're going to, what they're going to do for you, if they do it at all, is negotiate with your creditors. But what they don't tell you is that most creditors don't actually actually work with those companies. So they really cannot negotiate on your behalf. They really aren't going to be able to do anything that you can't do yourself. Um, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau has a, a whole section on their website uh, where people can go and get information on how to negotiate uh, with their creditors. The FTC has information that will help you negotiate with your creditors. And also the National Foundation for Credit Counseling um, will put you in touch with nonprofit consumer credit counseling agencies that can help you negotiate with your creditors. So that's the way to go as opposed to those operations. Um, I, and, and oftentimes, not all of them, oftentimes there's scams. And so I would just tell people that just don't go there. Um, you can do this on your own. Another ad that people see on TV, I didn't see that you wrote about them specifically in the book, but are reverse mortgages. In tough times, is that a good option for people? Well, reverse mortgages is a sort of a different type of product. And I would really caution people to use it in crisis. The way reverse mortgages work, kind of what the name says, is that you get a mortgage, but instead of making monthly payments, you don't have to make any payments. So that's, of course, very appealing to people. Um, You only have to pay that back if you move or you sell or you pass away. And it's only available to older uh, homeowners. Um, And the problem problem is if you, and you basically are pulling out, you have to have the house almost paid off or paid off. So you're pulling the equity and you just still have a loan. But if you have ongoing financial issues every month, you're short, very short. You'll go through that money really quickly. And those
those loans tend to be a little bit more expensive than traditional loans. And so thankfully, um, there's counseling that goes along with reverse mortgages. It can be helpful to a lot of people who say they have a lot of ho- money in their house. We call it house rich. Um, so you've got all your money tied up in your house, but you have just about enough to cover your expenses, but you need maybe money to fix the roof or do some other things. Then a reverse mortgage might work. But if you're short every single month um, and you get a reverse mortgage, you'll quickly go through that money and then you will be at a point where you, you know, you might have to move and there's no equity in the house. So I would be very, I would advise people to be very cautious about reverse mortgages, but they can work for some people. Two more areas that you write about. One is the IRS. If you owe lots of taxes and you, you can't pay them right now because of COVID related economy, you've been writing columns for the Washington Post. And most recently you described the IRS as a hot mess right now. What's going on there? Oh, well, <laughs> so, you know, obviously the IRS was besieged like every other company. They had to shut down because of COVID. Companies and agencies had to shut down. Um, and, but they were already having a problem even before the pandemic. Um, they just don't have the resources to, to work with all the taxpayers who need help. And the technology is outdated in a lot of cases. And that's because their budget has been cut. They weren't fully budgeted for the things that they need to do to help taxpayers. And so I've always advised people to call the IRS if you get into financial trouble. Good advice. Oh, you should do it no matter what, even though my column says you, it, you're you not likely to get through. Um, and so I really wanted to continue to do columns to, to, to point out how bad things are at the IRS, that you know, you're not likely to have them answer your phone. And even setting an online account, less than 50% of the people who try to set up an online account at the IRS fail because the, uh, the system that tries to uh, verify your identity is glitchy. And so I, you know, on the one hand, it's not completely the IRS fault, right? They haven't been fully funded the way they should be. The technology is old. They're losing workers. The pandemic hit. And, you know, then they were charged with giving um, stimulus payments to, you know, tens of millions of people. So three rounds of stimulus payments. And in the summer of 2021, they are going to be giving monthly uh, child tax credit payments um, for about six months. So that's a lot on their plate. On the other hand. Um, they need to be they need to be held accountable for the fact that their their customer service for taxpayers is horrible, uh, and that needs to be fixed. And we and people need to contact their congressional leaders um, to make sure that the IRS gets the funding that they need to help taxpayers. In uh, difficult times, you seem to be more benign about people tapping into their retirement savings. When is it okay to do that? Well, you know, if you don't have to tap it, don't tap it. Um, now, even, now, I shouldn't say even before, but before the pandemic, people were tapping their retirement for, you know, for a down payment on a home or, you know, to pay off debt. You know, don't do that. It's there for your retirement. It's tough enough to save that money. However, if you have lost your job, and you have no savings, no judgment. You, maybe you could save, maybe you couldn't. And that is a pot of money that is available to you. Sometimes you have to do what you have to do. And I couldn't sit here and say, don't touch that money. And you can't go buy groceries. I can't do that. So I give permission to people to tap it, but tap only what you need. And when things get better, try to put that money back. Or cut other expenses so that you can increase your contribution so you can catch up. Um, but in times of crisis, you got to go in crisis mode. And that may be tapping that money. Try to make it a last resort, however. And so in the book, I talk about the first place you should go. Like if you don't have savings, you know, tap the people in your lives. And, you know, saying that, people are like, what? I'm saying that if you need financial help, ask the people who love you and care about you first. Just say, I need help with my utility bills. Can you help me with groceries? And don't ask for a loan. Ask them to give you the money. And if you're on the other side of that request, don't demand that it be a loan. 
You know that they're suffering. You know they lost their job. How in the world are they going to pay you back if you can afford to give them the money? Give them the money. And that happened to me. You know, a relative um, lost her job in the, um, the restaurant business. Um, and she didn't come to me. She was telling another relative. And that relative talked to me because I didn't know her situation. Uh, and she said, you know, she's having a lot of trouble. Enough said. I called her. I asked her where did she live, the name of her rental company. I got all the information that I needed. And my husband and I sent her several rental payments. And we never talk about it. And she's like, oh, I'm going to pay you back. I said, absolutely not. This is a gift. And I'm never going to bring it up to her again. I'm never going to remind her. She doesn't have to say thank you for the rest of her life. It's what we're called to do, right? Why are we saving and stockpiling money if it's not to help the people in your lives? And, And if you got it like that, don't even wait for them to ask. You know who is in need. And if there's nobody in your circle who's in need, then go out to the community, Because the need is great. You don't have to look very far to help people. And I want to give people permission to do that, to ask, and then to receive. Well, this is a different direction, but if all else fails, what's your view of using bankruptcy laws? You know, they're there for a purpose. I don't think it should be your go-to right away. In fact, most people don't go to bankruptcy right away when they find in a, uh, that they're in a financial crisis. I covered bankruptcy for several years. I've sat on, on many bankruptcy cases and lots of people try to say, oh, people go skip it into bankruptcy court. Now, there are some people who try to take advantage of it, but the vast majority of people who are in bankruptcy don't want to be there. They want to pay their debts. And oftentimes those debts are medical debts. And so if you are in a situation where you just can't make it anymore, bankruptcy is there for a reason. And now it's mean tested so that if you have the ability to pay back your creditors, you're put into a chapter 13. And if you can't, and there's, you know, you just, it's not going to happen anytime soon, then you do qualify for a chapter seven, which will erase your debt. So the system is set up to weed out people who really can pay back their creditors. And I tell people, and I have advised people, particularly some seniors who got into some financial trouble and they wouldn't be able to pay those bills off till they are 100. I said, listen, talk to a bankruptcy um, attorney and see if this is the right option for you. One of the biggest concerns people have during the pandemic economy, if they've lost their jobs or if they're starting out in an entrepreneurial path is health care. Yeah. What's your guidance? So we need health care. And, and I know, especially with young adults, their first go-to is, well, I'll just get rid of health care or I won't even get health care. But we know one major health emergency could bankrupt you. Uh, and so I encourage people to get health insurance. And obviously for many people, health insurance is connected to our jobs, but there's the healthcare marketplace, which we call Obamacare, Obamacare, that will help you pay for, uh, your premiums. And so it, they're state run. So you go to the site um, and you look for a healthcare plan that you can afford and try to keep that plan. Um, but I don't have to tell people how our healthcare system is broken. I mean, there's so many people who don't have healthcare who just, they can't afford it. Um, but the, at least the, exchange, the exchanges through um, the Affordable Care Act provides an avenue for more people um, to get health coverage or to qualify uh, for, for Medicaid. During the pandemic, <clears throat> some segment of the population used the time available to start pursuing additional college degrees and sometimes graduate degrees. You seem to strike a real cautionary note about this. Why is that? Well, you know, I've seen this happen so much um, in my work in the community. People want to elevate their skills and they go back to graduate school. They get these degrees with debt, a boatload of debt. And then they don't actually end up making more money. So they got these degrees, but it hasn't really benefited them. 
um, I, you know, it's funny. I work with a, um, a, a couple and the husband was in grad school and it was going to end up costing them like $75,000 for his degree. And I said, what are you doing? And I asked them a series of questions. I said, well, are you sure this degree is going to elevate your salary? Who told you that? Well, he said, well, the college did. I said, okay, did you talk to anybody in the field that you're trying, because we're trying to switch uh, fields. Did you talk to anybody in the field and, and ask them whether this degree is going to help you get that job? And he sheepishly said, no. I said, well, who did you talk to? He only talked to the university. And I said, listen, you guys cannot afford to put this kind of debt on your books. Get out of grad school. And he was only a semester in. So he stopped. Now, lots of people were rolling their eyes at me like, what are you telling him? He's trying to advance for himself. But he had not done any of the research to find out whether that degree would actually help. So it turns out he dropped out. They paid off the little debt that they did have. And not even a year, I think it was maybe a year, uh, a year after this advice, he found the exact job that he wanted and he didn't need that degree and he didn't have that debt. So obviously there's some industries where you have to get an advanced degree, but be very cautious about taking on that degree with debt. Um, because if you can't pay it, which often happens, people then put that debt in deferral or forbearance. And then that interest starts to rack up. And before you know it, I've met people who started out with graduate debt of maybe $30,000 and five or six or seven years later, it's double or tripled. Um, because the interest is just, they pay, they aren't paying the debt and it adds up and it adds up. Um, so I just, it's just a cautionary tale. Um, I'm, I'm a big advocate for post-education, you know, secondary education. I have a master's degree in business from Johns Hopkins University, pay cash for it um, initially, but then my employer reimbursed me. But had that not happened, I had not had the cash, I wouldn't have gotten that degree. And it didn't help me get any raises in my business. Um, but I, I'm glad I have the knowledge. Um, and so some people, you, you know, have to ask your question, can I afford the knowledge for knowledge sake? Debt comes back again and again in this whole in conversation. And you, you write that all the, from the days of Big Mama, you've had a conservative view about it. You, you, you uh, have an episode in your book about a debate that you got into with Jared Bernstein. Who is he? <laughs> so he was an, advi an economic advisor in the Obama administration, and I believe he is now for the um, Biden administration. Um, and so he's so brilliant. He's just a brilliant economist. And so I was talking about how I hate debt, that if debt was a person, I'd slap it. I was on a, a program, a radio program, and he said, Michelle, do you really hate debt that much? And I said, absolutely. And so we had a back and forth conversation about the usefulness of debt. Um, and while he was absolutely right, I was more, <laughs> I was more right. <laughs> because what I was trying to communicate was that, you know, while certainly most people cannot buy a house without a mortgage, um, but that other areas of our life, even car purchases, we tend to just take on too much debt and that limits your economic possibilities going forward. So when a crisis hits, you're carrying such a heavy debt load that it makes things worse for you. Um, and I just try to people have people think about how much debt they're taking on. For example, like college, we, we characterize that debt as good debt. First of all, there's no such thing as good debt or bad debt. It's just debt. And so we told people, send your kid to college, send your kid to college. Good advice for most people. But then they, what they heard was at any cost. So they get, they have to go to a private school. They got to go to a pricey school. They have to go to a brand name school. They have to live on campus. They have to have that full experience, even though you don't have the money for all of that. So people are living beyond their means for the sake of college. So, because when you think about it, people are borrowing not just for tuition and fees, but for room and board. That would be the equivalent equivalent of a regular person with a regular job borrowing money to pay their rent. We would never tell people to do that. And yet when it comes to college, that's what we do. And so I just, so he and I were having a conversation about how I want people to rethink 
the whole idea of I have to take on debt for certain things. And so I try to encourage parents and students that if you can't afford that, then go to community college for two years and then transfer to a four-year university um, or live at home or commute. Just rethink this whole idea of what a college experience should be if you don't have the money for it. And I know people listening right now thinking, well, that's just not fair. I want my kid to have that college experience and it's not fair. Well, you know what? Life's not fair. I would rather you do what is prudent for you than to spend decades, decades in student loan debt. We have about 15 minutes left in our conversation in a chapter on the gig economy. You talk about the big increase in a marketplace of online reselling. It, and the statistics are impressive. In 2019, $28 billion marketplace Last year, uh, or next year, it will be up to $64 billion. What's going on there? And is it a safe place to look to earn extra money? I think for a lot of people who want to rethink how they work, they want to work when they want to work and the hours they want to work, the days they want to work. That's that's perfectly fine. People can make a living. However, as I was doing more research, I found out they aren't making as much as you think. Like some of the big companies, you could piece together enough um, hours to make a decent salary, but most people don't make enough to sustain themselves. However, the gig economy comes with flexibility and 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 particularly if you have children or you're caring for like maybe your elderly parents it gives you the freedom to help take care of them but with the gig economy jobs what you lose is health insurance and other benefits like saving for retirement now you can save for retirement on your own you can get a traditional ira or roth ira and build your own retirement portfolio but we know that studies show that people are more likely to save for retirement through their employer and why is that because it's automatic many companies now automatically put you into the retirement plan at at the workplace. And so because of inertia or procrastination, people don't get out of it. So even if they are only giving, you know, one to 3% of their salary to retirement, it's something. And it really helps people save for retirement when they do it through their workplace. You lose that sort of discipline, well, really isn't discipline, but you lose that when you have a gig job. Again, doesn't mean that you can't do it yourself, but but studies show that you are pushed to do it when you work for an employer. So you have to be super disciplined if you're going to work for yourself and work in the gig economy to make sure you're paying your estimated taxes on the income that you're earning. You have to make sure that you're paying into the social security systems because like times people get these jobs and maybe it's off the books or they don't have to report. They think they don't have to report it, which you do. Um, and that really can help um that really can hurt you in the future. So for example, you want to be sure that you're building the credits towards social security. That's an important um, benefit that you will get when it's time for you to retire. When people come to you and they're saying, I've got a little bit of money, but I'm thinking about investing in cryptocurrencies. (laughs) People are, seem to be making a lot here. What's your advice to them? Oh, my goodness. Well, first of all, cryptocurrency, legitimate or otherwise, is speculative investing. And most the average person should just be should not be in in that at all. Right. Um, uh, You should you investing should just be boring. Let me just say that. And I know people are like, what are you talking about? You know, the excitement of stocks and cryptocurrency. But listen, that is for people who can afford to lose all of their money and are speculating. It is akin to gambling. You know, sound investing is long-term um, and you can get great returns, good returns over time to keep pace with inflation and then some by growth index funds or, or, or low cost index funds. It's how I've invested. It's how my husband invested. And we it's how we sent all of our kids to college debt free. And really, isn't that what we're talking about? When we're talking about investing, we're talking about creating financial security for yourself. Can people become millionaires on these speculative investments? Sure they can. Just like when you go into a casino, somebody can hit that slot machine and win a million dollars. But the rest of the folks, what happens with them? They end up losing. Because guess what? The house always wins. 
Last question about the COVID economy, and that's on scams. What's been happening? Well, the scam artists read the news just like everybody else. And they, I mean, the pandemic has created, uh, or I shouldn't say this, I say, the pandemic has increased the number of scams because people are looking for ways to make money. They're looking for ways to grow their income. And unfortunately, the scammers are very skilled at getting people to buy into these schemes. There's like uh, Susu and Blessing Circles and Saving Clubs that are really just pyramid schemes. They know that people are looking for jobs and so their unemployment scheme, I'm oh, sorry, it's actually employment scheme. <laughs> They know people are looking for jobs, so they're employment schemes that you pay them money and they'll help you look for a job. I mean, I mean, the, 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 there's no end to the scams that are out there. And I wish I could just tell people a quick way to avoid the scams because saying it's too good, if it's too good to be true, it is, isn't enough. Because when you're in a crisis, you're looking for help. You're looking for a savior. And so these pitches sound believable to you because you're desperate. And all I tell people is check everything out. Um, I have this phrase that I talk about when Reagan was talking about the Russians. He said, trust, but verify. I tell people, trust no one, trust nothing that you that you're, you're told, even, even me, check out what I'm saying, you know, make sure that I'm legit with what I'm telling you I am, but just check. I don't even trust my husband. If he brought an investment vehicle to me, I'm going to check it out. Don't trust your pastor or your rabbi. Check everything out. Verify it. Call, look online, go to the FTC website, go to Consumer Financial Protection Bureau website, just please, SEC, just check everything out because the scammers are so good at what they do that what they're trying to pitch to you can sound believable. And when you're in a desperate situation and you're trying to maybe, you know, grow money quickly, you tend to not use some common sense that normally would be in place. So in our last few minutes, I want to talk a little bit more about you and your work. Um, How long have you been writing the Color of Money column now? (laughs) Oh, let me think. Um, I got to do some math on that. So I started the column in 1997. Ooh, that's a long time. (laughs) So over all those years, has your advice been pretty consistent or as the economy has changed and the country has changed, have you found yourself changing your advice? You know, I have not. I have worked for the Post almost three decades and I've come, I've written a column since 1997. Um, and believe it or not, the wisdom of how to handle your money does not change. With every crisis, people think, oh, there's a new thing. No, there's not. The basics of handling your money, stay the same, live below your means, don't pile on debt, save as much as you can, as often as you can. Think about your future. Um, All of that still applies no matter what's happening. And I love that, 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 that wisdom stays the same. All the things that my grandmother taught me, right? To save, to hate debt, to live below your means, to look to the future, to be a good decision maker. That's one thing we didn't cover that I try to cover in the book about how to make good financial decisions doesn't change with the crisis. And that's a good thing because sound financial money management really isn't even about the dollars a lot of times. It's about how people think, right? And I liken it to this. People, for example, are always asking me, what budget tool do you recommend? Uh, what app do you think will help me be a better money manager? And I go, I don't know. Pencil and paper is fine with me. That's really how I budget. Most of the time when my husband and I have our financial meetings, it's just like pen and paper. Um, and, and you say, what? You're not using a new technology? Here's the thing. You can have, let's just you try to do weight. And you buy an exercise bike. You buy the top of the line. You spend a couple thousand dollars on this great bike that talks to you and does all kinds of things. And you're thinking that's what's helping you lose weight. It is not. It's that you decided 
to change your lifestyle. You decided to get control over what you eat and exercise. And if you don't do that, that expensive bike, it just becomes a clothes hanger. You just throw clothes on it. Budgeting tool is the same way. It is not the tool that makes you a good money manager. It's your mind because you have decided, I want to take control. And then you just use the tool. It's just a plus. It's just a bonus. And so you don't need any special app. You don't need a special program. Just decide that I want to have financial security. And these are the things that you need to do. Budget, keep your debts low, save, help others. That's really the secret to this sauce. And so, no, it doesn't change from decade to decade or crisis to crisis. You have referenced your work with your church and you, your biography and your book talks about the prosperity partners ministry you've established. Are the goals basically what you've just described? They are. And what's different, however, I modeled the program after AA, uh, Alcoholics Anonymous. And there was a component of what they do that I tried to transfer to helping people with their money. So in addition to teaching about all the things that I've talked about and have, we have monthly workshops, we train a core of people who just become people's money accountability partners. That's why it's called prosperity partners. And so these are people, not financial experts, not, not accountants. These are regular folks who've gone through it. They, they maybe cracked, uh, racked up a bunch of debt, but then they paid it off where they were always really good savers and they just walk alongside people. We actually had a partner who was um, shopping. She was a shopaholic and she called a partner. She's like, I'm in, I'm in the store and I don't, I don't, I just, I need to buy this stuff. And her partner talked her um, out of buying stuff that she didn't need and put it back and said, come out of that store. And so that's what we try to do. We want you to know that there's somebody there that's going to help you. We're not judging you. We're not fuss at you though. We don't, you know, try to get you on the right road, but we're there to walk alongside you to make sure you do the budget that when you do a debt payment plan, that you stick with it, that when it comes time to send your kids to college, College. And let's say they've done everything that they're supposed to do. They have the A's. They have all the sports and the extracurricular activities. And they want to go to that brand name school and you just don't have the money. But you want to, you know, you're thinking about taking all these loans. You're thinking about letting them take all their loans. And we talk you out of that. Because guess what? Your kid is going to be okay. If they did all that stuff, they're already bright. They're going to make it because they're motivated, right? And I tell people, I work at the Washington Post, which is a great, it's the top of my line, right, business. And the guy who sat across me when I got to the Post went to Harvard. Love him to death. We were really good friends. But guess what? We both worked at the Washington Post. He went to Harvard and I went to a state school. I was abandoned by my parents. I was raised um, a low income. But we both got to the Post at the same time. And so that's the message. I was motivated enough to get there. Now, he was too. and But he had great pedigree. But we both ended up at the Washington Post. Your kid can do well without you taking on all that debt. And those are the kinds of stories and, and motivation we give people in the program. There's also a prison component of the program. So we work, my husband and I work um, with, in, with prisons in Maryland to help inmates who are about to be released handle their money so that when they come out, they'll be better money managers. Um, and I just, you know, I believe in giving back. And um, I love that work. I love the prison work. I love working with individuals to help them achieve their financial goals so they can have, you know, financial freedom so that when that crisis happens, maybe they can't weather the whole storm, but they can weather it a little bit better. Well, we're just about out of time. I want to invite people who are watching and listening that they can find more of your work online through your Color of Money column that's in, syndicated by the Washington Post. Got a great website with lots of financial advice on it and new book, What to Do With Your Money When Crisis Hits. Michelle Singletary, thank you for spending an hour with C-SPAN. Oh, thank you for having me. Thanks for listening to C-SPAN's Q&A. And subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts so you'll never miss an episode. And while you're there, please take a minute to rate and review us. You can also send us an email about Q&A at podcasts at c-span.org. Send me your questions, your comments, or ideas. Your feedback is welcome.